Okay, we're going to get started. Welcome everyone. This is the first of what we hope to be many webinars presented by the Vermont Communication Task Force. Today's webinar is Walking the Talk of Presumption of Competence. The presenters are Pascal Chang and Tracy Thresher. The webinar is being recorded and we're going to be posting it on the Developmental Disability Services Division website. That's uh, at www.ddsd.vermont.gov. And we'll be sending that out as well once we have it posted and send out the link. So we've muted everybody, all the participants. If for some reason you don't see that you're muted, um, you can try muting yourself, but I think you should all be muted. There is a chat. A conversation box. I think some of you have already been using it, so you should be able to find it on either on the left side of your screen, or some people have it up on the right upper side, a little chat icon. So you can type in questions or comments. And in particular, if there's any reason why you can't see or hear the presentation, let us know. We also plan to have a little time at the end of the presentation for Tracy to answer some questions. So we're going to start the, the presentation with, uh, start off with Tracy's PowerPoint, and we'll go from here. Hi, everyone. This is Pascal Chang. I'm actually going to be reading Tracy's text uh, for his presentation. And the title of Tracy's talk is Walking a Talk of Presuming Competence. And this, Tracy is sharing his story, his journey of communication, and also all the work that he's done to change people's idea of competence and intelligence. Then, yeah, that is me. I, I say that or can I speak? I know it's more. I am really Trace Preston. You should have mentioned Tracy is reading some of the text. I am Tracy Thresher from the land of Green Mountains. I see Tracy, there's we're, the leaves are way past peak in that picture. Um, to be in this place of creating change in the world is fabulously wonderful. I started my path many moons ago to educate myself in the school of self-advocacy, and my life has truly become the one I dreamed of. I do not speak because I have autism. Autism means that I have a difficult time controlling my movements. It means that I find it difficult to do ordinary things that are quite easy for others. Most people take their ability to talk for granted, and I take my inability to talk quite seriously. I have had the great opportunity to share my vision, changing the world's view of how they perceive people with disabilities. Together, Larry and I share our stories of having intelligence inside of us that is not often placed highly in the perception of society. This misperception is mostly due to lack of knowledge by the general population who tend to judge, who tend to judge outward appearances. Bob Williams calls this the cloak of incompetence that society places on individuals who are labeled disabled. I will start off with my life for typing. It is with a grain of salt that typing was my way to gain respect from others. 
like Bob Williams, when I didn't have certain tools, I was viewed on behavior and appearance. Yes. Teachers working with me did not know that my intelligent thoughts were there. So they focused on the behavior and it felt like I was treated with a different attitude compared to other students. I was isolated in my school environment for most of the day. For most of my day, I was in a special classroom doing boring puzzles. I was an intelligent person doing rote time fillers and missing out on adventures of learning history, literature, and particularly lacking in friendships with others. I felt heavy with anxiety most days because my stuck thoughts had no way to come out. So my behaviors became my only communication. I was in my 20s when, I, when my life took a path towards communication, and I was chosen to be a part of a facilitated communication project. I was one of the first people in my green mountains of Vermont treated to this life-changing mode of communication. It was scary and exciting to have the foundation of a new thing in my life. I was one lucky man to meet Alan Kurt in 1990. Alan was motivated to unlock my wisdom. He treated me to intelligent conversation. It was a wonderful time in my life because for the very first time I was being seen as someone with something to say. Being spoken to in an intelligent manner was exhilarating. My inner thoughts for so long had hidden in my mind, looking for light like trees needing to flourish. Alan understood my intelligence. It was not easy, but we pushed through my sometimes crazy behavior and I could pass reliable thoughts. I am now working at typing real thoughts, and that is possible with well-trained facilitators. The good part is that I have had fantastic, really hard-working facilitators, and with them, I have expressed many thoughts and had good things happen in my life. I experienced big time problems with anxiety, impulsive movement problems, which is poor impulse control, perseveration, high muscle tone, and lack of proprioception. This affects everything I do in, in life. With time and patience, I can have some really thoughtful conversations. What works for me is communicating with thinking patient people who understand my autism and work through the problems of anxiety and impulsive movement to focus on thoughtful communication. I wonder, Tracy, if you're gonna wear that same costume this coming Halloween. <laughs> A uh, volume of communication is hearing my voice and taking the time to type and talk with me. Wanting to type is one thing, having people to talk to is another. So much of the communication process depends on people taking the time to listen and to ask enticing questions. Sometimes I think saying the words is what will convince others of how I really do understand. But of course, I can't say the words and passively stand alone, hoping that the person trying to communicate with me 
will see that I want social contact, relationship, and conversation. With a respectful favorite communication partner, I can experience those things. Without people satisfying my meaningful typing conversations, I'm at risk as being labeled as not understanding, not wanting to communicate, or wanting to do something else. On my journey with traveling the world to film Wretches and Jabbers, I was able to release the old dark cloak of autism. What an experience that was. My life is now mine to teach others about overcoming communication barriers. I believe it is important to break down barriers of labeling to move to inclusion. I have traveled the world with Harvey Leboy, Larry Bissonette, and Pascal Chang as the Fab Four, typing pearls of wisdom to educators, parents, professionals, and students to change their views of disability. My mind has been extremely focused on the power of inclusion. Inclusion, like communication, is paramount to healthy children and long-term success. I want educators to understand that all children benefit from inclusion because all children can make contributions with proper supports. Inclusion is not mainstreaming. More than idealistic political correctness, it is celebrating our interconnectedness. Lessons of humanity lift our social fabric to magical task tapestries where natural abilities may soar. Like Larry and I have communicated to diverse audiences in our travels, we are first men with intelligence. One of the best questions Larry and I have been asked was, what do you tell parents of kids with disabilities who oppose inclusion? My response, what kind of life are we talking about with seclusion and sameness and focused on disability? Now that we are here, it's due to being included. What hope is there without, being, without seeing us in the mix? Even though my friends and I possess intelligent ideas, the people in the educational system, for the most part, have historically not understood how to educate us. Teaching kids, parents, and teachers is one of my goals. I want to plot out the path towards training teachers to look at their students with a wide lens of possibility. A lens is the way to see the pupil's intelligence that is always there, but sometimes has difficulty coming out through communication. It is imperative that educators think about presuming competence and look for ways to see the intelligence in all of us. The students should not have to prove they are capable of learning. The school needs to provide the educational experiences to teach the student literacy, communication, and skills to be a learner. And uh, the boy in the picture is, um, he's no longer a boy, he's a young adult named Henry. And Tracy got to know Henry when he traveled to Florida to do a movie screening with Larry. And Henry, um, at the time, at the time this picture was taken, was trying to go to his local school, but because of it, and his local school was actually right down the street from where he lived, but the school system told him because of his label of autism that he needed to go to a special school on the other side of town. Um, and so he, he had a campaign called I Stand with Henry so that he could attend his local school and Tracy was involved in supporting Henry 
on his campaign. It really is a wide open world with a reliable way to communicate. I want to be a life force in changing people's attitude towards disability. I am a self advocate who is inspired by those who want to share their voice. In my profession as an advocate, I travel around the country and beyond to teach people about advocacy, autism, movement differences, and communication. I live, breathe, and think about quality of life initiatives. I am passionate about where our country is going as far as education and services for all citizens are concerned. My work is cut out for me with travel, typing, and presenting to teach the presumption of competence, and I am fired up with possibility. The presumption of competence is the key to opening the barriers people may have in their minds. Working in this field of communication and rights for all Jazz is my motivation to connect and work with as many people as humanly possible. As our society is exposed to the thinking and true reality that presuming competence only increases one's quality of life, I can rest easy at night knowing that I have done my part. We are the perfect example of intelligence working itself out in a much different way. Thank right. you, Tracy. So Tracy, after we'll be taking questions in a little bit. Um. So thanks, Tracy. Um, we're going to now hear from Pascal, but I'm going to first pull up um, Pascal's PowerPoint presentation. And I'm also going to ask, I'm hearing some voices coming through on our, we're recording this and this um, also on the speaker that you're hearing us through. Um, I'm wondering if um, there might be state employees who have to actually mute their phone. So if you could just double mute it, that would be great. Um, so we have a clearer recording. All right, Pascal, you're okay. on. All right. So I'm going to be sharing about sharing some ideas of how in terms of the title, Walking and Talk, how we can put presuming competence into action. And much of what I'm going to be talking about really comes from the words of Tracy and Larry, because I think they have been the people who have taught me most about this idea and how to uh, put it into action. And I'm going to start actually with a quote from a parent named Ariane Zorcher. And, uh, Ariane is a parent of a girl named Emma, um, and Ariane actually, for her, had a life-changing experience as a parent when she met Tracy and Larry um, a number of years ago at a conference. And what she had realized was that she had seen her daughter in a completely different way than that did not allow her daughter the kind of support and growth that would have happened if she had not listened to, as she said, listened to lots of doctors and psychologists, et cetera. And, and so she, she as in her journey, she uh, started a blog called Emma's Hope Book. And in her blog, she wrote a lot about the presumption of competence because for her, that really had the greatest impact on her life as a parent. And what she wrote was, what I have come to understand is that a presumption of competence is much more than a set of beliefs. It is a way of interacting with another human being who is seen as a true equal and is having the same basic human rights as I have. I should mention, Emma, after this, started learning to type to communicate after Ariane had met Tracy and Larry. Presumed competence means Assume your child is aware and able to understand, even though they may not show this to you in a way that you are able to recognize or understand. 
Presumed competence means talk to your child or the other person as you would a same age, non-autistic child or person. Presumed competence is a practice. Much like anything I want to get good at, I must practice this. It's very much an action. So some of the, so what I'm gonna share now are just some ideas of how we can actually put presumed competence into practice. And before I do that, I wanted to share that uh, there's a documentary that recently came out about Emma. Actually, Emma wrote the script and was involved in direction. It's called Unspoken. And if you go to the web, if you, there's a link underneath there. The name of the documentary is Unspoken. And there's a website for the film. And there's a trailer and then um, information on how you, I believe, you can stream it. And we'll put the link to this, to Unspoken, up with the link to the webinar when we post it on our website. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a short documentary about Emma and her, her journey of communication. So I want to start by um, part of moving towards a practice of the presumption of con competence is changing some attitudes and assumptions. And one of those areas is labeling, labels. Um, and the idea of labeling, we're all familiar with it. And I um, was struck by something that Larry wrote quite a while ago called, and what he said was fastening labels on people is like leasing cars with the destinations deter determined beforehand. And, you know, all of us are probably familiar with labels that have been in people's files, for example, records, and how that, how that tends to predict what, where people will be, what they will be doing. And Larry has a perspective on this in terms of his own career as an artist. And he goes on to write, it's attitudes more that limit opportunities rather than the disability itself. Larry likes people to see him first as primarily an artist instead of autistic man. And Tracy wants you to see him as leading man who gets the girl like, like George Clooney. Larry and Tracy have a lot of back and forth about who should be the leading man. And, and Larry will actually say, you may, be, you may be like George Clooney, but I get the art chicks, as he would say. So anyway, um, so the photographs here are from Larry, every year there's a big arts festival in Burlington, Vermont, where we live. It's one of the largest arts events in the state. And every year they have a juried art show. And Larry has participated in the festival for the last several years. And he, a couple of years ago, he entered a couple of paintings in the, the juried art show. And he ended up being awarded the second prize in the, the um, festival for his work. And you can see it there in the upper right-hand corner. And one of the great things about it was that he just entered as an artist. People didn't know that he was a person with autism. He was just like all the other artists. Um, and, uh, and what he said about that is labeling creates exclusion. So asserting the talents of people over their label promotes their inclusion. So the fact that he didn't was des describe himself as an artist rather than a person of, with autism, what, Larry's thought about that is it helps with his inclusion in the community and the art world. And he goes on to say, you can be a poet, painter, athlete, or reality TV addict, but whatever your passion is, that should define you. And just as a side note, um, the title Wretches and Jabbers, for those of you who don't know, was um, came up, the, the idea for it came from Auntie, one of the people in, from Finland in the film. And Auntie was making fun of the practice of labeling people. So the, he referred to himself as a wretch and the people who could talk with their voices as jabbers. Uh, picking up on what Tracy said, we are the perfect example of intelligence working itself out in a much different way is redefining how we see intelligence or how we 
look for it. And I often, this is a, a slide which kind of shows a cycle that happens for many people. And I often use this in communication trainings. And the, uh, as you can see, what happens, if you look on the top line, perception drives expectation. And I think you can apply this in a number of different situations, but I, just as an example, in our educational system, it, it often is the case, not so much anymore, I think schools are trying to move away from this, but there's a perception that there's a group of students, for example, that people see as going to college, and then another group that people see as not going to college. And so if, if the perception is that you're not going to college, then that means that there are probably going to be lower expectations for you as a student. And that means that you're probably going to have lesser opportunities or less quality opportunities for learning and then less achievement. And then that sort of drives, that, that continues to promote the percep perception of you as a, a student. The same is true for a person who does not speak. If the perception is that you lack intelligence, then people are going to have less expectation. They're not going to interact with you. And that means less opportunity for communication and then less less achievement in terms of your growing your communication skills. So it's a pretty, I think, powerful kind of framework to think about and see if we can sort of change that. And so it starts at the perception level. Uh, Doug Bicklin, who many of you know, said this, if you want to see confidence, it helps if, if you look for it. And, and I often run into this question with uh, people People will say, well, I don't think the, if the person cannot speak, I don't see how they can read, or I don't see how they could have learned letters and words and so on. And so, but that comes from not looking for examples where the person might be doing something with print, such as in this picture. Tracy, if you spend time with Tracy, you'll see Tracy pull out the newspaper, look at, uh, like he's reading some, some documents here, you'll see Tracy actually interacting with print in some way, but people people would not necessarily see that as Tracy reading unless they change their perception about him. And that's true for many people I know, is that we, we have to just look for, instead of seeing, just basing our, basing our judgments on, on perceiving on a perception that if you can't speak, that must mean you have limited ability to learn or, or to do things with letters and words that, that you have to kind of flip that around and see what, look for areas where the person is demonstrating that. And it might not be in the typical way. People might be familiar with this idea of the least dangerous assumption. So sometimes to change a perception, you actually, as Anne McDonald is somebody that uh, wrote a book called Annie's Coming Out with Rosemary Crosley, who many, many of you might know. And Anne McDonald wrote, unless someone makes a jump by going outside the handicapped person's previous stage of communication, there is no way the speechless person can do so. Failure is no crime. Failure to give the, some, the benefit of the doubt is. So it often requires, especially people, it's harder, I think, if you've known a person in a certain way for a very long time, it's hard to make that jump. Um, but, it, but it is important to do, because then you can't move forward in terms of this idea of presuming competence. I learned a lot about, this, about how to think about communication, being with Tracy and Larry in the filming of Wretches and Jabbers. Um, and, and one idea was, and this is, comes from Larry, all people want communication. And along with that, we also say all people can communicate. But all, Tracy, I think you were referencing this a little bit when you talked about people working through your movement issues and behavior, that that might have given the impression that people thought that maybe you, it might give the impression that you weren't interested in communicating as, a, as opposed to if the outward things were just things that people had to help support you to work through. 
So even if someone doesn't appear to be interested, we can't read that necessarily as that they don't want to communicate. There may be other things that are are getting in the way of them demonstrating that. Populate my day with opportunities for communication. So when uh, I got a full appreciation for this when we were filming Wretches and Jabbers and one of the things that really struck me about the whole experience was that Larry and Tracy had opportunities throughout every day. And it wasn't just typing, it was speaking, it was a lot of social interaction. And this was a unique experience. It wasn't that, it's not that everybody gets to make a movie, but what it, what it told me or what it showed me is that if you have many different opportunities throughout your day and then you have the support with your communication, is that you can you can really grow a lot and with one of the interesting things that happened was that there, the camera and sound people that follow us around they actually would follow for example larry out we would finish a presentation and larry would go out into the lobby outside of a conference room and we weren't there and they would be following Larry as a camera and they would be commenting afterwards how much interaction was happening with Larry without any of us there that he just had all this opportunity to to have social interaction with people um, and that they noticed a real growth in his speaking over the course of the filming of the movie uh, and so Taking that into practice, I, there are many opportunities throughout a person's day that should allow for some communication to occur. We just have to be, mind, you know, be making a list of those things, thinking about how we can integrate communication in those situ situations. And going out to eat, in particular, is one that you know many of us do, and it's a great opportunity for communication. Tracy talked a lot about this in his, his presentation. The power of communication is rooted in relationships. I want social contact, relationship, and conversation. I want to be in the mis mix, ask me enticing question. I really like Tracy's use of the word enticing because it means not it means questions that are interesting, that are going to um, provoke interesting conversation. And that that happens when you're in in a, in the mix in in with other people in a social situation. And Tracy goes on to say, with time and patience, I can have some really thoughtful conversations. What works for me is communicating with thinking patient people, understand my autism, and work through the problems of anxiety and impulsive movement to focus on thoughtful communication and the emphasis on thoughtful. The last part I'm going to talk about is how do we create a culture of presuming competence? And I, what I mean by that is a culture of comp presuming competence in the community. And I particularly think that self-advocates who communicate in other ways besides speaking can have a powerful impact on this. And, I've, and, and this all comes from the experience of being with Tracy and Larry and doing a lot of different um, events and activities. So Larry, I want to start with this quote, which is a call to arms from Larry. And, and he had written that, spot yourself as a person of potential first. Look openly out for opportunities to pursue your talents. Please plan on making yourself like Clark Kent and change in phone, phone booth of communication into Superman of intelligent words. Tracy and Larry did a lot of public education, not so much in, not just in big kind of speaking engagements or presentations, but on the ground in places like restaurants. And I can't, this is just one of many, many times where Tracy is giving his order in a restaurant, but in the course of that is having a conversation with one of the wait staff in a restaurant. And 
just generally people want to be able to interact. They want to have the opportunity. So if the person has the way and the opportunity, it can happen. Uh, just two weeks, about two weeks ago, uh, Larry, Tracy was at um, an event at the University of Vermont Medical Center, the Language Access and Communication Expo. And this was a uh, event where lots of different organizations involved in the world of communication had uh, tables and and hospital personnel, medical staff, um, students would come through and learn about all the different services and supports that were out there. And they got to meet Tracy and hear from his perspective. So this is a great opportunity to educate people who are in the medical field about people who communicate in other ways besides speaking. Going out to school, Tracy and Larry have done many presentations to local schools. And I think this has had a really big impact because of course you're talking to the next generation of people who will be in the community and there'll be employers, there'll be people in social events. And if they've had experience of meeting Tracy and Larry as students, that's probably going to carry over when they're, when they're adults. And I thought it closed because, of course, the Red Sox beat the Yankees last night, right, Tracy? Um, at the, so in film screenings and presentations, Tracy has mentioned, said, thinking differently about disability will take all of our efforts to promote inclusion and challenge attitudes that are way, way off base. And let's do Fenway Park showing of our movie to hit the presumption of confidence home run. So that's, I think that's a very fitting <laughs> quote to end uh, this part of the presentation. So. Um, You'll, you'll, this is another resource and um, about the presumption of confidence. And this woman, Kathy Snow, has written several things on the topic. And so there'll be a way for that people to get this. Um, sure, and they can yeah. see it both if they yeah. look at the presentation again, but we can try to post right. that as well. Yeah. So to, to finish up the main, the, the presentation part. We're going to show a video of Tracy and Larry at, at doing some education with uh, teenagers in, at a conference in Houston for teenage Jewish teens who are, are learning about disability. And this happened several years ago um, in Houston, Texas. So we're going to go to the video. Okay, so bear with me just a moment while we get the video up. Right. No, that's not what I wanted to do. Are you you're trying to get to the... I just got it just a second. Oh, I know. Is that showing? Oh, okay. Yeah. All right, folks, this is... I'm a newbie at this, so bear with me. So I am gonna, um, one thing I'm gonna do before I start the video is we need to, um, I need to mute the recording because we have a technical difficulty with recording the video on the, on the um, webinar. So if you're listening to this after the fact, there's gonna be a break in the recording during this, but it's, so you can, we'll have the link so you can watch the video separately. Okay, now I'm hoping you guys could hear that and that I didn't, by muting the, the record, I mean, excuse me, by um, 